So in our talk about the sternoclavicular joint injuries, we will start with an introduction. So sternoclavicular joint connects the sternal end of the clavicle that you can see right here in this picture with the clavicular notch of the sternum that you can see right here. So basically it connects the sternum with the clavicle and it is stabilized by many ligaments, including the anterior sternoclavicular ligament, the posterior capsular ligament, the sternoclavicular ligament, and the intraarticular disc ligament. And when there is injury to this joint, the sternoclavicular joint, all of those ligaments also will be injured. Now, the sternoclavicular joint injuries are uncommon and mostly caused by trauma. For example, lateral compression of the shoulder during a road traffic accident and crush injuries. The SC joint injuries also can be a traumatic, meaning they occur without trauma due to ligamentous laxity. And some of these injuries are dangerous. There might be damage done to a mediastinal structure lying behind the clavicle because remember behind the joint behind the SC joint there is the mediastinum and once there is injury to the SC joint there is potential for injury for the mediastinum too. Now let's move on to talk about the classification of these injuries. So the SC joint injuries are classified into subrains and subluxations and in subrains and subluxations there is ligamentous and joint capsule injury but it is not complete. These injuries also classified into dislocations which include anterior and posterior dislocations. So in anterior dislocations the medial end of the clavicle will move forward anteriorly and in posterior dislocations the medial end of the clavicle will move posteriorly towards the mediastinum. And in dislocations, the ligaments and the joint capsule of the SC joint had sustained a complete injury. SC joint injuries also classified into physial fracture in patients younger than 25 years old. So in patients where their growth plate had not ossified yet, these patients might get a physial fracture affecting their growth plate and it is mostly a Salter Harris type 2 fracture. And regarding dislocations, the anterior dislocation of the SC joint is more common than the posterior dislocation. Now let's talk about the clinical features of the SC joint injuries. So in subrains and subluxations, the patient complain of pain at the joint area and that is usually the only complaint of the patient. While in anterior dislocation of the SC joint, the dislocated clavicle forms a prominent swelling on the SC joint. So there will be prominent swelling over the SC joint area. And the patient complain of pain at the joint and there are usually no damage to the mediastinal structures with anterior dislocation because the clavicle is dislocating anteriorly away from the mediastinum. Regarding the clinical features of the posterior dislocations, so in posterior SC joint dislocation, it is dangerous because the dislocated medial clavicle might pressure the trachea because it is lying behind the clavicle and once it moves backward, it might pressure the trachea causing dyspnea or it might pressure the large vessels behind the clavicle causing venous congestion at the neck and arm or it may pressure the esophagus causing dysphagia and look for these findings in patient complaining of pain at the SC joint so to exclude the posterior dislocation. And in posterior dislocation, the patient also complain of pain at the joint area. Now let's talk about the imaging in SC joint injuries. So the plain x-rays are difficult to detect the SC dislocation on. 
and the best method is to detect them clinically by the swelling that appears on the SC joint area and if it was hard to detect them clinically then the CT scanning is the ideal method for diagnosis. Now let's talk about the treatment. So in SC joint sprains and subluxations they do not require a specific treatment beside giving the patient a sling for comfort and they return to normal activity after three months. Regarding the treatment of anterior dislocations, so those can be reduced by putting pressure on the clavicle while pulling on the arm with the shoulder abducted. And after reduction, the patient is given a figure of eight bandage around their shoulders and it is worn for three weeks and full function might take several months to return and redislocation is common. Now regarding the treatment of posterior dislocations, so those should be reduced because of the potential harm that might be done to the structures behind the clavicle and reduction of these injuries is done closed and general anesthesia might be used and the patient is in supine position with a sandbag between their scapulae and then the arm is pulled with the shoulder abducted and extended and the joint reduced with a snap and stay reduced. If this fails, then the medial end of the clavicle is grasped by a bone forceps and pulled. And if this also fail, then open reduction is done and care taken not to damage the mediastinal structures behind the clavicle during the open reduction procedure. And after reduction of both types, the anterior and posterior dislocations, the shoulders are braced with a figure of eight bandage for three weeks. Finally, let's talk about complications. So possible complications is arterial or venous compression, especially during the posterior dislocations because those structures are lying behind the clavicle and also tracheal and laryngeal edema might occur and esophageal injury is a possible complication and also pneumothorax because the clavicle might injure the pleura and with that we reach the end of this video thank you guys for watching please support this video by giving it a like and commenting your ideas and questions and this video is a part of a bigger class it's called the shoulder and arm trauma masterclass you can check it out if you want